Ah, kia ora tātou, te tuatahi ngā mihi ki ngā iwi takitaki o te rohi nei, nā rātou te mana, nā rātou te whenua, nā rātou te tino rangatiratanga mō aki tonu. Ko au he hua wairi matahiko ki te Ropu Catalyst, I'll speak in English now, I won't continue in te reo Māori. It's quite fun to do that overseas and watch people slightly panic as they think the entire talk might be in a language they don't understand. So I'm not really going to talk about koha until maybe the last slide here, but it's more of a generic talk, uh, and I think um, with koha, because of the flexibility and the fact that we can control what it does, we have an example, uh, a chance to be an exemplar in respecting Indigenous data sovereignty with our software. So, and this talk follows on from Ord's talk around um, uh, privacy. Um, that was quite focused on individual rights and privacy, this is focused on group rights and privacy, so I think it follows quite nicely. Okay, so who am I? Uh, I'm Chris Gormack. Um, I'm from Kaitahu and Kaitimamui. They're two iwi, or sometimes translated as tribes, in the South Island of New Zealand. Um, if you ever get to New Zealand, uh, you go to Dunedin and then you drive a bit further north. That's uh, kind of the area I'm around from. Um, kind of halfway-ish, two-thirds-ish of the way down the east coast of, of the South Island. Not too far from where Robin's from. Um, there's a place there called Moiraki. It has these amazing boulders. That's where I'm from. I have the uh, infamy of being one of the original Koha developers. Um, my role now at, at work is not doing Koha development anymore. I don't get paid to do Koha development. Um, so I do it in my own time. Uh, I'm in the senior leadership team at work now. My role is Kaihua Waire Matahiko, and that uh, role is for me to make Catalyst, where I work, a better place for Māori to work at and a better place for Māori organisations to work with. Um, so, just a small job. Uh, I was a board member of Creative Commons for a while. I was a board member of the National Digital Forum in New Zealand. And I also have another job. Well, actually, I have three jobs, but this is another one where I'm, I work for a, an organisation called Te Kahui Raronga, who are an operational arm of the National Iwi Chairs, and my role there is to help build um, a sovereign, indigenous sovereign data network um, is the plan. But starting in New Zealand, just in, in one country to start with. So, Te Mana Raronga is a Māori sovereignty network. Um, I'm not going to be speaking for them. Um, I'm not going to be speaking for my employer. I'm not going to be speaking for anyone other than myself. Well, I, what I usually say is, if you like it, then I'm speaking for them. If, if you don't like it, then it's all my fault. So um, you can do it that way. Um, and in the spirit of doing things that I'm not being allowed to have permission to do yet, I would like to uh, um, formally propose that Kohakon 2025 is in Wellington, New Zealand. Um, I haven't talked to anyone about being allowed to do that. <laughs> but... Um, I'll deal with the consequences with my boss when I get back to New Zealand. Okay, so I'm going to try and do uh, 100 and, no, 200 years of history in, in, in seven seconds, but not quite. I'll do a brief New Zealand history lesson to set the scene for what... So what I'm going to try and do is talk about Indigenous data sovereignty, but from a Māori data sovereignty lens, because I can't speak for any other Indigenous people. I can only speak for myself. Um, and then I'll eventually, hopefully, get to why it's relevant to libraries. And if I don't run out of time first. No, I'll, I'll get there. Um, so, in New, 1835, in New Zealand, uh, uh, there was a direct declaration of independence signed called He Whakaputanga. Um, it set the scene for the, um, the upcoming treaty with the British Crown. Um, and it's makes New Zealand kind of unique in terms of indigenous populations around the world because this was a declaration of independence that was uh, recognised by the British Crown. So they, they, at 1835, saw New Zealand as a sovereign country. Um, well, Aotearoa, obviously, at that point. It wasn't called New Zealand. Um, and then, so, in 1840, uh, the, the Treaty of Waitangi, or Te Tiriti of Waitangi, was signed. So this was interesting because it was a treaty between two sovereign nations. Uh, most tr uh, treaties with indigenous peoples were not uh, between... Were, the colonising people did not recognise the 
colonized people as equal status. Um, so this, was, this is quite unique in that. There were two versions. Almost every, all the Māori people signed one version that says Māori are guaranteed sovereignty and they allow governorship to the British to look after their own interests in New Zealand. But five people, Māori signed the English version, which said sovereignty is ceded to the Crown. The Crown like to use the English version because it says they have legitimacy to exist. But under international law, Māori is still sovereign in New Zealand. So that's kind of the setting the scene for data sovereignty. Um, the other piece of legislation which Finland has voted for and uh, voiced of support for is the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, which New Zealand took a long time to sign, actually. It only signed about 10 years ago, so it was far behind Finland in that case. Um, but there, it does say that um, recognition to the rights of Indigenous people must be given, must be given, con given consideration in kind of all areas of life which me leans to, as per the inherent sovereign right, sovereignty rights, Indigenous people have the right to control the data about them. So that's kind of how we're getting to Indigenous and data sovereignty. So in terms of what I'm going to be talking about, um, the narrow definition of data sovereignty is really just to do with the legal jurisdiction data resides in. So um, you could think of, uh, yeah, nation states, um, the data that they hold in their legal jurisdiction. That's uh, one. I'm talking more about not just who, where it's held, but how it's used, where, um, and who it is used by. So, um, kind of more like the GDPR kind of stuff. So what? There's no point writing a, a, a book unless you can quote yourself out of it. So I'm quoting myself out of a book. Um, it's, yeah, it, I don't recommend um, writing a book. It was one of the hardest things I've ever done. And I, I realize now why Māori had an oral, not written culture beforehand, because writing sucks. Um, so yeah, Māori data sovereignty in this case, it's uh, not just redefining how data is stored news, but it's actually a refusal of the current practices around um, data usage, data collecting, and, and often in New Zealand, data is used against us as Māori. So we have lots of uh, deprivation index. Um, you'll hear horrible statistics, which are true, um, that Māori women are the most incarcerated indigenous population in the world. 50% um, of the uh, incarcerated or pe people in prison in New Zealand uh, are of Māori descent descent and we make up just over 17 percent of the population so you can see it's hugely skewed and so most of the data you hear about Māori is deprivation data or those kind of horrible statistics and it's also used to reinforce a lot of those things as well because if you're constantly told that 50 percent of the population is criminals then you over police that population and make it worse so if we widen it out to more indigenous data sovereignty to kind of make it a more international one, it's concerned, yeah, with the rights of indigenous people to control data derived and pertaining to them and their knowledge systems, customs or territories. And hopefully you can see how this may be starting to bleed over into some of the library, of the data that libraries collect and hold and use um, and how that may um, need to be considered. So I'm going to define what is Māori data, and, and you can kind of extrapolate that out to what is indigenous data. So the definition I'm using is Māori data refers to digital or digitizable, so um, when it's pre-digital, uh, information or knowledge that is about or from Māori people, our language, culture, resources or environment. So it's a pretty wide definition. Um, that's pretty much all data in New Zealand probably would come under this in some way. Um, but yeah, it's the most important thing is like, is about or from. Um, so if we take that to indigenous data, it's a data from or about indigenous communities and lands. So, um, so pretty much 
the same kind of definition with the words indigenous instead of Māori. But it means that you can see here, if you with the Sami people or in Australia with the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders or in the US with many nations and Canada with many more nations, that this lot, lots of the things that you, data that you collect is probably going to have, um, will have a subset of it be indigenous data. And what you do with that is, is up to you, but I'm hopefully going to convince you you should do something good with it. So, Te Manararanga, the organisation, one of the organisations I belong to, it was set up to um, promote and assert um, data sovereignty and, and, and advance Māori aspirations so that we wanted to basically stop the data being used against us and be able to use it for us instead um, and, and control how it's collected what it's used for, when it's disposed of, all the kind of things that most countries have a reasonable idea about individual data, like I said, but not a great plan what to do with groups of uh, data. So in the last two ones, yeah, of, uh, of like growing infrastructure and capability as well. So I'm going to quickly talk through these uh, principles of Māori data sovereignty and hopefully um, that'll explain kind of, well, you'll see where I'm going anyway. So rangatiratanga, authority, whakapapa, which is relationships, whanaungatanga, which are obligations, kotahitanga, collective benefit, manakitanga, which is reciprocity, and kaitiakitanga, which is guardianship. There's a whole PDF there, you can read it all. I'll make these slides available to everyone. I'm going to go through these kind of fast because I, I don't have 28 hours um, to, to go to this talk, but... Um, this is the area that I'm mostly involved in. So the first one, Rangatira Tanga, is around control, jurisdiction and self-determination. Um, so this is a, uh, a photo I took. Um, it's a juxtaposition. That's a, a former Prime Minister of New Zealand. And this is the Māori sovereignty flag being um, held up. It was in the foreshore and seabed um, protests which was in 2004, which was the, it's the most recent uh, land grab from the government from taking Māori land. They legislated all of the foreshore and the seabed out to um, be under their control uh, and said Māori had no right to it. So I feel like the, the way that data is being grabbed by uh, governments and corporations is very similar to the way that land was grabbed um, by colonisation. So I'd like to make that parallel. So I'm interested in the control and the jurisdiction. So I'm interested in things like keeping data that's about Māori in New Zealand under New Zealand legal jurisdiction. So not using things like ALMA where your data is stored in the US and you live in New Zealand, not using things where like Google Analytics where your data is stored overseas and you live in New Zealand, all those kind of things. So that's where my interest lies. But the other Really useful things to think about is whakapapa, which um, you could translate as genealogy. In the Māori worldview, everything has genealogy. So if you look here, this is the genealogy of rocks. So rocks come from Rongi and Papa, the, the earth and the sky, and then they had a children, Tane, who's the forest, and basically everything is contextual and linked. Um, and so that you can think about that as a useful way to think about data too, rather than thinking of, of data points as um, disaggregate, disaggregated and individual points that are actually everything is related to everything else. You can't have individual data uh, um, if, there, if I'm talking about my, um, my, say my family tree that touches so many other people's stuff or uh, even my circulation history might have clues about other people's stuff in as well. It's very hard to separate things away. So um, the other thing that, that uh, we'd like to talk about is obligations, which I think most of the Koha community, and I'm, I'm sure the Peel community understand too, it, it's a core tenet of open source kind of thing, is that you, it, it's not a one-way street. There is, if you're using data, there's obligations on you to look after it and to share it back, and the people, so in an open source project, there's obligations to give a little bit back to the project and stuff as well, so, and accountability stuff. These have formulated a lot to try and talk to um, 
governments and local governments and uh, organisations like that to try and convince them that they actually have obligations over um, how the data they collect is used and stored, not just to themselves or to individuals, but to the groups that it may tell stories about. Kotakitanga, that's uh, also around building that capacity so that the indigenous data should be able to be used to build capacity for indigenous people, um, not used against them. Manakitanga, um, I'll read this quote out because it's, it's a nice one. It's about respect and consent. Um, so manakitanga is an old word, but it remains a beautiful way of approaching relationships, whether they be between friends, family, clients, or business associates. Living by the principles of manakitanga means stopping to ask, whose mana am I encouraging? Mana is kind of like, not really prestige, but kind of like, oh, it's a really hard one to translate. Um, kind of like, it's kind of the essence of who you are, I guess. So when you're when you're doing you're thinking when you're doing anything, you can think you can ask yourself, um, whose mana am I enhancing with this, and am I elevating others, um, whether through words, thoughts, or actions, and in, if, in uplifting others and giving them respect and aroha, which means love, we also lift our own mana. So that's kind of um, a nice way to think of manakitanga. Manakitanga actually means, if you break the words, mine is quite cool, um, it's well, similar to kind of German that you can munge words together and make another word, so this is actually five, uh, four words. And kaitiakitanga, which this is probably where libraries come into play the most, so they're holding data that is about indigenous people often and it's, un, it's up to them to look after that uh, in a good way. So that's really around restrictions, around the privacy stuff, around the security stuff. Um, what, yeah, how long are you keeping it? All those kind of things in ethics and guardianship. But also the first one, like I touched on, sovereignty, where is your data being stored? Is a really big one. You can't really assert proper guardianship if you've given away the sovereignty over your data. So in the US, they have and Canada, they have the CARE principles, which is a, a smaller version. I'm not going to work their way through all of these, but if you Google the CARE principles, you'll find that. Um, and this is why, this, like what I was talking about, this is why um, having control and access to the data and knowing how it's used and from um, is good because in New Zealand we have this thing called the Integrated Data Infrastructure. It's run by Statistics New Zealand. It, it gathers data from all sorts of sources. The main one is the census, but it also can get data from libraries. It can get data from police. It gets data from Ministry of Justice, all sorts of things. They wanted, this is the, the Ministry of Justice, wanted to use the integrated data um, infrastructure to uh, basically predict uh, future offending. You've seen the movie Minority Report with, with things, so that's what they kind of wanted to do. Um, and so it would be horrible if like the books that you borrowed were used as part of this in integrated data structure to say that, oh, they might be going to become a criminal or something. So th there's real, real world problems that happen um, when you lose control of, of the data. Another one is that generally, um, Generally, across the world, uh, indigenous people are usually towards the lowest rung in the thing and the most uh, easy to be further discriminated against. And so uh, the colonisation of data is just a further ongoing colonisation effort against indigenous people in general. I bet this wasn't the talk you were expecting, eh? Um, but I hope you're getting something out of it. Um, so I'm kind of getting to the bit... Yep, good. I'm kind of getting to the bit that's more for libraries. So, do we know where all our data is being stored? If someone asked us, if someone walked into your library and said, where is all the data that you hold being stored, could you tell them? I suspect most of us, some, well actually probably most of us in the room potentially could, but a lot of libraries wouldn't be able to tell you. Especially using a proprietary system, it could be anywhere. Can we get all of it out at any time? Um, with Koha we can, with a lot of other systems you, you can't, you know. Uh, we bump into that doing migrations all the time. 
other vendors will actually charge you more money to take your own data back out of your system. Um, can we identify indigenous data? If someone uh, from uh, Lapland or someone come and asked, could you tell me what are the reading patterns of, of Sami children in, in such an area, could we do that? Could we do that in New Zealand with Māori data? No, because we don't collect that kind of information. So sometimes it's not just that we're collecting too much, sometimes we aren't collecting enough or we're collecting the wrong things as well. Um, what access do we provide for Indigenous people? If they did want to know those kind of things and learn um, to, be able to, to be able to use that data to empower their own communities, is there any way for people to get that data out of our systems? And yeah, and the final one, should we even be holding it? If there's, there may be, this is less probably for uh, libraries, more for museums and, and galleries and stuff. There may be knowledge and uh, data in those things that is not the place of those institutions to hold and it should be returned to the people whose it's about. Um, so I think if we think about Koha, it does quite well on at least a couple of these. We can get the data out at any time, and we do know where most of us is, is stored. We may do the wrong thing. We may still use Google Analytics. We might do some other things uh, where some libraries, if we heard earlier, have gotten into trouble about um, using Google Analytics in Finland in the wrong way. Um, so, but I don't think we can do the... Um, well, we could do the identify indigenous data too, but it would be hard. But I don't think we provide any access in a kind of a nice way. So I'd like to posit that we sh Kaupapa Māori, or the way of thinking in Māori, is always mindful of context. So we should do that with data. We should understand the context that's been collected and the context that's being held. And we must not see things as isolated data points. That down that road becomes very dangerous. That's where you get ideas like we can build a sensing soon prediction system and you start seeing people as people, you see them as data points. We must understand the whakapapa or the provenance or of the data, where it came from, who's it about, um, how many people have touched it, all those kind of things. That leads into the, the context. We must be attentive to history. We must understand that the populations and the users we serve are not all equal, that uh, there are differing needs and users and people's use case for the data may be quite different depending on their background and, and their um, status. And if, if we do these things, it will make all data science better, not just libraries, but everything to do with data. So a good, uh, uh, a, um, it's quite old now, but a blog post I encourage you to recommend is the Good Data Manifesto. And it makes, it basically works through those kind of questions around why, why do we, yeah, we're really good usually at um, to answering questions like what do we do with all this data, how do we catalogue it and how should we use them. What we don't often ask are how do we, um, should we even collect, aggregate, catalogue and use this data? Um, and if so, how? And if, and if, yeah, and if what would be an ethical means of doing so? And I think um, circulation data is a, a perfect one. It's a valuable, valuable user resource for housebound borrowers, like was touched on, or people who want to know what they read, but it also can be used against them in, in repressive regimes. Um, borrowing books about LBGTQ things may get you uh, executed or put in jail or horrible things like that. So there are things around um, data that we need to be considerate of. And there are some organised, I don't know any in Europe, but Te Mana Raronga and Te Kahui Raronga are in um, New Zealand. There is USIDSN, which I'm sure um, people can make contact with in the, in the States. There's OCAP, which are in Canada. And there's Mayam Nyamri Wingara, which are in uh, Australia. Um, and so they're thinking about these kind of questions. Uh, and that's about it. Thank you, Chris. Mm -hmm. Did any of this come into play during the uh, trademark lawsuit that went down in New Zealand over the yeah, Koha name? Yeah, that's a good 
good question. Um, so some of you may or may not be aware, but in uh, or what have been late 2009, early 2010, or late 2010, early 2011, somewhere around there, uh, a US company filed a trademark claim on the word koha, which is a Māori word in New Zealand. Um, and so <laughs> we had to spend, uh, Catalyst, who I work for, and the Hora Whenua Library Trust, two years fighting them in the court system to, to get that trademark invalidated. So it's a good example of like not considering things in context um, and seeing things as isolated points. So it's just a word. Uh, it's a Māori concept and a Māori word, and you're trying to take it away from Māori people being able to use it in their own country. Um, so good question, Nick. Yes, this was really uh, eye-opening in the sense that uh, we heard a lot of uh, stories about repatriation of like physical yeah. cult cultural heritage. And uh, I have a second cousin in Norway who has been working in order to return skulls in a, a museum in Oslo back to, to the Skoltsami area in, in northern Norway. But uh, one could even almost say that data is more important or at least equally important as, as the physical artifacts. So. Okay, thank you for this interesting presentation, and, and an, it's an important issue that you raised up here. Uh, in, I have a colleague in the uh, University of uh, Lapland here in Finland, who actually, I think she might be even chairperson of Polar Libraries Colloquy, or something, I cannot pronounce it. Mm -hmm. And I know that she will have a poster next week in Rotterdam, so this is for all to market her work. Uh, they are de they are dealing with the same issue, this metadata of indigenous uh, people. And of course, as you mentioned, Sa Sami people in Finland uh, is yeah. in part of this. So, so thank you. She will have a poster and in, in, is there a, like a conference in Rotterdam? Yes. Actually, I'm lucky to to join uh, IFLA oh. <laughs> Rotterdam next week. So, so and I will meet her and, and I will tell about your work as well. Thank you. Sorry. There's a mic drop. <laughs> okay, perhaps that was then the sign. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Come you. to the end. Thank you.